Hello, and welcome to How to Build Creative Resonance. I am Deborah Henson Conant, and I am here with some intrepid and inspiring, a bunch of inspiring harpists who have just gone through the five day vision to action challenge. And whether you have just, you know, skimmed the videos or whether you commented each day and whether you made videos each day, you have a sense of what vision music is now that it is a way of going to the essence of music, getting rid of the complexities so that you can really connect and expand out from it. Now, vision music is, is just a term I came up with because I like to think about the vision aspect of it. This form of improv if, would be called motivic improv. It's improvisation built on a motif. And to just, to just go over it again, we learned five different motifs that all fit together into a suite. And by a motif, I mean that it's an idea rather than a whole set of music. When you're playing from a motif, you're going back to the seed of an idea the same way a composer does. So as a composer, I would come up with some idea, something like this. This is the very first motif. Actually, I'm now playing it differently than it's written, but so our first motif was like, was that. That was the whole melodic idea, but there was a shift in harmony. Where we shifted the harmony and that was the mo and the combination of those two things was the motivic the motivic idea. And from there, we can start applying all kinds of ideas or not. So when you're when you're playing and, and Hildy is, is thinking about doing the challenge and how quickly can she do it, you can take these motifs and you can just play them exactly as they are. And just explore what does that mean? What does that mean emotionally as we go from one to the other? Or you can start applying all kinds of improvisational and compositional ideas to it, like So now I'm spinning off the motif. I can also change the accompaniment. If you've been in the academy, these are familiar because we talk about these ideas. We talk about accompanimental patterns. We talk about bass and accompaniment. So you can take these motifs and you can play them simply and they are beautiful. They are foundational compositional ideas. That was the first one. The second one is all about the opening up of emotional space, I think. It starts out all the white strings plus an A and an E. The second one just goes down to G. That repeats. And then when it goes down one step further to F, it opens up all the strings of the harp. Now I'm just playing with that concept. I'm using a gliss and I'm playing melodies with my left hand. But the idea is still white strings and an A and an E. White strings and a G and a D. White strings and an A and an E. White strings and a G and a D and then go down to F and all the strings open up. So that is a compositional idea. And if I were if I were to turn that into the music that you might buy in sheet music, I would build it out into, um, you know, I would add all kinds of notes. And then if you bought that, you would then have to translate all the notes that I had come up with my compositional the way I'd spun that compositional idea out and then and that's why it would be so complex and hard to do you would be interpreting my interpretation of this motif but in vision music or motivic improv you can go directly you're going directly to the heart of what I as a composer would start with so that's what we started with and today what we're going to talk about is how to use that to develop creative resonance. So creative resonance, 
And you may hear me playing some of the themes as I talk about this. Creative resonance is in a sense, I was thinking about it last night, and, and the experience that I will have with creative resonance is I am playing my harp, which is playing me, which is playing my harp, which is playing me, which is playing my harp, which is playing me, which is playing my harp. It goes back and forth that as we get more and more deeply connected to what we're doing, a creative resonance starts to develop. And this happens because we have fluency, because instead of dealing with all the complexity, we go back to the simple and we start building. There's seven principles. I'm going to go through them today. They're the seven principles of, they're, I call them the string, seven strings of passion. They're seven principles that will take you from creative impulse to creative expression. And they are at the heart of what we are going to be doing with this music for the first quarter at Hip Harp Academy. And you can do it. You have you have the sheet. I'm, I'm the handout here has all the seven strings in it. It's a, um, it's a much bigger handout than it was supposed to be, but I couldn't find the simpler handout. So you get the whole thing. So I'm going to just take you through those seven strings and I want you to think about them and I want you to think about how you would apply these ideas to what you learned in this challenge. And, and I'm gonna just kind of show you as we go. So the first string is the string of impulse. Before we start judging ourselves and deciding that we're good enough or bad enough, before we think, well, I can play the harp or I can't play the harp, or that person plays the harp so well, we see a harp or we see something that we love and we reach out to it. We reach out to it because there's an impulse in us to touch or to do, to, to, to feel it, to have it in our hands, to have it in our mouths <laughs> when we're little kids, but to have it coming out of our mouths and to have it in our hands. And that, that is creative impulse the impulse to touch, to do, to, to, to be, to express. How we get from there to, uh, to being able to do it, especially as music becomes more and more complex, that's what creative resonance is about. When we're a little kid and we reach out for something, it's magical and we are magical because we have that resonance. As we grow up and we start doing more and more complex things, we have to think about how to develop this creative resonance. And we do that by applying these seven strings. The first is to think about impulse. And you can think about that now, just for a moment. Just jot down a sketch. What was one of your first magical moments with the harp or with music? For me, it was hearing Debussy's La Mer on the radio. And suddenly, suddenly the whole world opened up a world, a realm of experience and existence opened up to me that had not been open before. And I've spent the rest of my life working towards that realm to create that realm in my own music. That's impulse. The second string is the string of structure. So when I, was, when I was seven, my mother remarried, and she married a man who was a child psychologist. So he was always kind of doing these experiments on me, psychological things. I mean, like giving me Rorschach um, you know, uh, cards to play with and asking me what I saw. One night he gave me a, uh, he put the bowl of sugar on the table and he gave me a, bowl, a cup of warm water. He gave me a pencil and a string. And he told me to spoon the sugar into the cup of water and to stir it up. And when I stirred it up, it disappeared. And so he said, put more in and stir it up again. And I put it in and it stirred it up and it disappeared. And he said, put more in, put more in. And I put it in and I stirred it until that whole glass was full of this beautiful swirling sugar crystals. And then he said, put this string 
tie it onto this pencil and hang it down into that glass of water. And I did that. And then he said, now it's time for bed. And so I went to bed. And in the morning I came out and there on the kitchen table was a glass with a string in it that had sugar crystals all over it. It was the string in the sugar water. It was covered with crystals. And I said, how did that happen? This magic, how did this magic happen? And he said, well, sugar, when it will crystallize, that's what it does. That's just what sugar does it will come together, it will crystallize. But when there is a string, it will crystallize on that string. And so you must look for the strings, the strings and the sugar water in life, that internal structure, that internal flexible structure that the crystals can crystallize on. And that is structure the internal flexible structure that holds for the magic of the crystallization that will happen. And that is the second string of passion. So in the last week, you just learned five different structures. And then you learned that when you put them together, they created an overarching structure. And that structure gives you the freedom. Structure is the foundation of creative freedom. So looking for that structure or being given that structure is the second string in the strings of passion. And the strings of passion are to take you to that creative resonance that connects you with music and with the instrument and with your own voice. The third string in the strings of passion is the string of character. Now, when I was a little kid, I would play the piano. I didn't know how to play the piano, but I would play just for fun. And I, you've probably heard me tell this story because I tell it all the time. This was my experience. They would probably just wanted me to get out of their way. And all my relatives had pianos and my grandmother had this old, old player piano with all these, you know, mechanics and stuff. But I loved playing and I would always tell a story. I would tell a story and I would play the music that brought that story alive in my mind. And the story was almost, it had the elements that I knew how to play. I knew how to play rain. I knew how to play someone walking down into the darkness. I knew how to play the rumble of thunder. And I knew how to play running back up. And I knew how to play some kind of sun, sunlight. I knew how to play these things. And so I made every story out of these elements. There would be a princess who was playing out in the, in the light and her, you know, the ball she was playing with went down a rabbit hole and she went down. She, and this is me playing the piano, just telling the story. Went down and it got darker and darker and darker and darker. And when she got down there, there was a rumble of thunder. And then she heard something come out of the thunder and that something ran after her and it ran up and she ran up and she ran up until she turned and sent it back down into the darkness. And there she was again in the beautiful light rain. So these were the stories that I told myself and what I didn't know was that I was playing with character. I didn't know anything about the notes. I didn't know what C was. I mean, I was like five years old. I had not had a lesson. I wouldn't have a lesson for years, but I was playing with the toy of the piano and I was playing with the character of music and how music can enhance that character. And when I wanted it to be dark and loud, it was dark and loud. When I wanted it to be light because it was light rain, it was light because of the light rain. And so what I, I didn't discover this because I didn't know what I was doing, but I at five, and we can all do it, was creating the experience of music with only the first three strings. 
an impulse to tell a story, a structure of the story, and the character with which I was playing with my instrument. And anyone can do that. You don't need to know how to play an instrument in order to create character in what you're doing, in order to understand the structure, especially when you're playing vision music and the structure is very clear. So those are the first three principles, the first three strings of passion, and you can apply them to any music that you play. It's great to have the vision music suite, any one of them or all of them, because you can use those little ideas to start exploring. What's your impulse? You get the structure, I've given it to you in the, in the, in the little motif. How can you add character? What are the different kinds of character? If you told a different story with this motif, how would the character change, the character of the music? And, you know, we see this all the time. I mean, when you look at music, it says mezzo forte, it says piano, it says legato, it says staccato. But that's not the character. That's the, the um, composer's best, best effort to actually give you some words for character. So just for a second here, I want you to think about the word pianissimo. And I just want you to, I'm, we're going to say it, I just want you to say pianissimo. Say it out loud, you know, say pian, pianissimo. It's like pianissimo. Why would something be pianissimo? What, what are the reasons something would be so soft that it's almost inaudible? Like, go ahead and share in the chat. What are some of the reasons for that? Why might somebody be that, that, that quiet? You might be telling a secret that's beautiful. You might be telling a secret. You, I love this. Is you might be tiptoeing around. You might be feeling vulnerable. It might be a lullaby. It might. You might uh, again a whisper. You might be simulating a whisper, trying to make the sound of a whisper. You might be hiding. It might be night. You might be trying to ca capture somebody's attention by being soft. It might be a lullaby to pull in the ear. It's a feeling of quietness. You grab the attention of the audience. Uh, I'm just saying, just in life, you know, why would why would you? You could sneak, you know, you might be sneaking up on somebody. You might be shy. There might be feathers falling. It, you might be listening. It, you might be timid or gentle. The baby is sleeping. <laughs> so I'm going to cry. These are just so beautiful. To draw the listener even closer. Soul ascending, tired and weary, playing for a baby in the NICU. Tranquility. You are tiny. You are tiny. You might be feeling scared. All of that is character. That is human character, human connection. All in this word pianissimo. So this word is just talking about you know, the volume, but you all can see that that pianissimo could mean so many deep, powerful, beautiful things. And as you start applying that character to your music and you start playing with it and you start taking any of these stories. You can take that story um, of, 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 um, of playing to a baby who's just been born. And you have a different feeling of that softness. You could take any of these stories and it will change the way that you're playing this music. It will bring it alive. It will bring every piece that you play. It will start telling a story within it. You don't even have to tell the story to people. They will hear their own story in it if you are adding that character. So character is the third string of passion. You don't need to know anything about music to use the first three strings. The fourth string of passion is the string of roles. Roles are when we start playing with others and when we start not being just alone, but a role, for example, there are three roles in music. There's bass, there's accompaniment, and there's melody. Those are the three roles. And we're, we're lucky we have an instrument, we can play all those roles. The trick is we, gotta, we only have two hands and there's three roles. So unless we're singing, in which case we're playing the role of the melody, we have to figure out how to play those three roles with the two hands. And so roles is the, is the fourth string, and it helps us. So for example, in the fourth, um, 
in the fourth string of uh, in, in the fourth uh, motif that we use it's like this and we can add all kinds of character we can make it We can make it bluesy if we can, or we can keep it really open. It doesn't matter. It, it's, a, it's a motif. We can change the character of it. And when we start engaging in the roles, we can make choices about if I know that this is the bass and this is the accompaniment, I can make choices based on my ability. If I only have one finger on my left hand, I'm not going to worry about there being an octave. I'm going to. or I'm going to play it like this because I only have one finger on my left hand. I'm going to use my limitations, which are really just the characteristics of my physical body and, um, and the characteristics of the harp, where I am technically. I'm going to engage in those roles in my way, in the way that works for me. If I can't conceive yet of playing and then leaping up, if that's too hard for me, then I'm not going to do it. I'm going to say, I'm going to play those roles at the same with, 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 with the left hand and then the right hand, because I'm breaking down the music into its roles. When you're starting to play a piece of music and it's too complicated for you, one of the most powerful things you can do is to start looking at what are the roles. Uh, is this the bass line? A lot of times there's a lot more bass movement than you need. Once you can break it down and say, oh, that's the bass note. I really only need that one. You can let go of a lot of others. You, once you're aware of what's the accompaniment, you can decide to leave it out because it doesn't need to be there, or you can decide to put it in in a simpler way. This is a more complex concept. Get, as we go further, it gets more complex. The other thing that you can do with roles, and this is a little bit simpler, this is really beautiful. So the, the, the logistical part of roles is there's three roles in music, bass, accompaniment, and melody. That means that we are playing all those three roles, or it means we're playing music with two friends. And it means that if we know what our roles are, we can actually take that same motif or whatever we're playing and we can split it apart. If we can see the roles, we can play together. This is such a deep, powerful concept. If you think about what I just said, because I just thought about it, I just heard it newly. If you know what the roles are, you can break it apart and do it together. You are no longer alone. You can be doing it in community with others or as a team or as a collaboration. But you can't do that if you don't know how to break it down. And so then you're stuck just trying to do something that's complex that you can't do and you can't figure it out. So that's one idea of roles. That's one of the things that we'll be working on, that we work on all the time in the academy. Another important, powerful part of a role that is like in between roles and characters, you can take on a role. And that role will give you a different character. Now, I always love, and I don't know why I don't just do this every day, I love taking on the role of the goddess Diana. I love being the goddess Diana because, I love being the goddess Diana because the harp is so much like, you know, a bow. And I just, I just think about that. And so I have such, like when I walk, look at my body. I mean, I'm standing here like a schlump, you know, and then I'm like, as soon as I'm the goddess Diana, everything changes i my whole body moves so everybody you, you can you can turn your video off if you want but just think for a second what is it like to be the goddess diana you know forever powerful you know forever you know bringing spring and all the things that she i don't know what all the things she does but imagine it and go to the instrument as the goddess diana it's very different you're going to engage completely differently. You take yourself out, the self you think you are with all your inabilities, all the things that you do wrong, all the things where you're not enough, throw them away for a moment and be this goddess or this god or this troll or whatever it is that empowers you 
and see what happens to your connection to that instrument when you take on that role that opens up this character. Because roles are the fourth string of passion. That's where you shift from being alone to being able to open up and take other things in, not just structures, but other people, other ideas in. That's the fourth string of passion. The fifth string of passion is the string of practice. Now, it's the string we all love. We don't all love it, and we don't all love it because it's got all kinds of other all kinds of other concepts that go along with it. Like you've got to go to practice. You, you have to go to your room and practice. You have to practice to get it right. You have it wrong. You have to go and get it right. You did it wrong again. That's kind of how we see practice. We can break practice down and we can break it down into just remembering. I remember when I was first starting the harp, when I was in my early 20s, and I remember tr just practicing with a metronome, slowing it down, speeding it up, just completely, I'm, I'm never going to get this, I'm never going to get this, and I remember throwing myself onto the floor and just sobbing, and just what came into my head is, why do I always have to work twice as hard as everyone else just to be half as good? And that's how I felt, that was my truth. And it felt like it would never end. And it would never end if I were to keep raising the bar, which is what we do. We keep raising the bar. So we are constantly perpetrating this concept upon ourselves that we are not good enough and that we need to practice more rather than having a practice in which we do what we can and let it get to us. Or we do what we can't yet, but in a way that we're engaged with it for itself. So for example, um, oh God, I spent, um, well, here's just an example of doing something I can do. Um, I was, oh, I was playing with this motif um, for, I was putting a timer on about two weeks ago, and I was playing with this motif for 15 minutes. Oh no, I think that was it. I would just keep playing and playing and playing. But by putting on the timer, I stopped thinking, am I going to get this? Am I not going to get this? It was, let me play with this and let it open up. Now, there's a whole other aspect. So that's having a practice and letting the practice get to you. There's a whole other aspect here, which is you have to be bad to be good. So you, you, this is part of creative resonance is getting comfortable with, with not having it all together and not being perfect. So I just want to tell you a story here that um, when I first started, uh, when I first started going international, I was invited to teach at the Edinburgh Harp Festival, and I was invited to come there and teach blues to the Celtic harpists, but I was just falling in love with, with what they were doing. And I really fell in love with these two um, harpists called um, Patsy Seddon and Mary McMaster, and they had a group called Sheilas, and they'd made some records and they were great. I, and I was very opinionated about people's voices. I grew up with singers and blah, 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 blah. And I heard them and I was like, well, they're really great harp players, but I don't know, their, their, their singing isn't as, as good as their harp playing. And, and like, this was my opinion. Um, and, and I actually went to Patsy and I said, I don't understand, like, wh why do you sing? And I'm sure I said it like, like, why do you sing? You know, like, it's just not that good. I mean, seriously, I don't know where I came off doing that, but, but I'm glad I did, because I was like, why, why are you singing? And she was like, because that's what we do. And I thought, well, I'm never letting anyone hear me sing like that. And so I go off, and the next year I come back, and they make their next album, and they're, as always, playing amazingly, and their singing is actually a, better. And then I come back the third year, and they make a third album, and they're playing as great as always, and their singing is really great but mine isn't. Mine isn't any better because I haven't been doing it. And at that point is when I realized 
uh, if I'm going to sing, because it's a really deeply important part, and I know this is meaningful to so many of you, whether it's about singing or storytelling or something else, it's a meaningful part of my expression of myself to do this, whether I'm good at it or whether I'm bad at it. What, what she said to me, this is what we do. And she had the courage to do this is what we do. And it expanded and bloomed into this gorgeous thing. So I realized I was going to have to start doing that. And so I started singing. And the very first time I sang in a, in a, in a club, I was with this bass player. And I was like saying, like, what was this, like, Georgia on my mind. And I was like, you know, Georgia, oh, Georgia whatever, whatever I was doing. I don't know what I was doing. And then at the end, I turned to him and I said, what'd you think? And he said, you are a very good harp player. And I was like, what about the singing? And he was like, you are a very good harp player. And I heard what he was saying. And I realized at that moment, I could have just gone into a ball and, and hidden, but I realized I heard what Patsy said to me. And I was like, okay, this is it. This is the beginning. I went home, I started singing people. I remember somebody came up to my manager after my first show when I was singing. She was like, you have to tell Deborah to stop singing. She's going to ruin her career. And my manager came to me and she said, I, I hate to tell you this, but this woman who we both admire, she said, you have to stop singing or it's going to ruin your career. And I could have gone into a ball and hidden, but I, I said, this is what I do. This is what I do. And, and so I kept singing. And that's when I began to learn that everything is born slimy. Everything, everything new that we bring out, it, it comes out. That's how it comes out. That's just how it is. And we, we need to get through that. And that also is a practice. And we can practice it. We can practice and practice and practice. But at some point, we have to share it. And that's one of the things that is so powerful about having a community where you can share that. And that's what I've tried to build with Hip Harp Academy is a place where you can share that and where you where people where I will see and where the others will see what is there? What is beautiful there? What is the part of that gift that you are giving me so that I can share it back with you so that you have the space for that to bloom instead of having it shut down? Because we have to have that kind of environment. So the, the fourth string, no, the fifth string is the string of practice. It is, uh, is putting ourselves into that practice. It is also practicing. It is also having an environment in which we can practice sharing who we are so that we can develop who we are. And people will, having, having a group of people who will see us as we, uh, what we are, what we want to share and help us get there rather than being, that's not this or that's not that. And that we need that environment in order to grow. So we have the string of structure. We have the string, oh, we have the string of impulse that we start with. We have the string of structure. We have the string of character. We have the string of practice. And then comes the string of, oh, I'm sorry, I forget to say roles. Let me say that again. Impulse, to do, to be, to express ourselves, the structure. The foundation that lets us, gives us the freedom to do that. The character that we bring to it, that brings it alive. And then the roles that open it up to not being alone, but be able to do it with other people and be able to have this dimension of doing it. And then there's the practice, it, the practice of actually doing it. That brings us to the sixth string, which is the string of deconstruction. And deconstruction is it's basically what I've just done here. I've just deconstructed the, the spectrum or the, you know, the arc of going from impulse to, from creative impulse to creative expression. Deconstruction is, and it's really interesting that there's structure at the beginning. You start with a structure, but then 
you deconstruct it to bring it back to an even more essential point. So I've deconstructed the motivic improv to give to you, but you will discover and discover and discover and discover and spin it out and spin it out. And there will become a time. I mean, every day is a great time, but who knows when you will be okay. Now let me, let me find the essence of this where you will deconstruct that. And when you deconstruct it, you may find something different than the structure I gave you. You may find a different essence. There may be different crystals of sugar or crystals of whatever that have grown on that string. And that is when you start to own this, when you deconstruct it and you, it, it, you make it even easier to be in your hands. So that is the sixth string of passion. And the seventh string of passion is the string of liftoff. That is when you let go of all the other thoughts, all the other strings, and you allow that moment to happen. When you accept that you've learned what you can, you accept that you can do what you can, and you fully bring yourself into the moment and into what you're playing, You've practiced it, you've changed it, you've done what you can, you've created what you can with it. And in this moment, you just let go of everything that isn't and you just let it be exactly what it is. That moment of liftoff where you are completely connected to it. And where it is expressing you, expressing it, expressing you, expressing it. And you will start to experience that there is an instrument inside of you. You become an instrument of creative expression. And then your hands translate them that to this instrument. And this instrument becomes that expression of you that gives you even more resonance that you then give back to this instrument and when you give it back to this instrument it gives it back to you and that comes back to it and this creative resonance grows and grows until you have created this realm of, of magic, this realm of being in the moment with your instrument and with the music that you are giving as a gift. And in that moment, you are actually giving the gift that you are. That, that flows on that, on that resonance, that creative resonance. And that is the next step of this journey. The first step was to learn these simple motifs that you can put together. And then this, this step here is to then apply those principles of creative resonance so that you become music deeper and deeper and your partnership with the harp becomes deeper and deeper. And then you can apply this, these principles to any music and every music and every part of your life. That is how you build creative resonance. And it's all outlined in the, in the handout that I gave you, all those seven principles. And what we do in the academy in the first quarter is that we will take, you will, you will take either the music that you just learned, or a piece that you already know, or you will learn to tell your story with music, you'll tell, take one of those three things, a very simple structure, and over the weeks, you will apply these strings of passion to it so that the resonance becomes larger and larger, and so that you have the experience of adding that creative resonance to one thing and then experiencing what it's like to express that at the end. And once you've done that once, it's so much easier to apply it to so many other things. That is how to build it. And that's what, it, it, it's such a simple idea and a powerful idea, but for me personally, I need to do it together with other people. 
even if I have, I mean, you have everything, you have the whole recipe. If you have the handout and you have the, the vision music, you have the whole recipe. And for me, I, I need to do that in community with others. I need to see how others are doing it. I need to be guided. I need to have accountability. I need to have a place to go where I feel safe. And that is what I've built in the academy. That is why the academy is there, to have the support for all of this learning. And, and it's there and it's, and it's open. And that's why I wanted to share this today so that you know that you, it, you can take everything that I've given you and you can go and run with it. And if you, if you are the kind of person who wants and needs, like me, who needs the structure in which to let it bloom, that's what we have in the academy. All right, so I'm gonna ask you for your takeaways. And, um, oh, this is beautiful, okay. Okay, beautiful comments. I'm going to read some of them, um, and I'm sure I'll miss some of them. Aha, Karen said, I remember, I somehow feel that I should stand at my harp when I play the Diana role. And yeah, Karen, in my journey towards these seven strings of passion, which took me years and decades, my journey was decades, and standing at the harp was one part of that journey. And that meant that I had to have a harp that I could stand at. And that is what led me to collaborate with CAMAC in creating the DHC. So the need to have that connection with the instrument led to me creating a prototype, taking it to Joel Garnier, showing him, and, and then became that, you know, the, the, the roles. He, he, he was a visionary who saw my vision. And he took it and, and, and he and Jacquez built this instrument so that I could stand and so that we can all stand and be Diana at the harp. And Anne says, I love it. You have to be bad to be good. One, one to remember when things aren't going well. Yeah, to have that. And it's so great to have a place to be able to share something that isn't perfect and know that people are not going to be picking it apart, but they are going to be looking at what is there that you can't see. They're going to be showing you what, what you are doing that's magnificent so that you don't lose that. And Christine, hi, Christine says, I love it. I was at that festival and I've shared this experience of yours with many of my students regarding singing. That's what we do. Yes, yes, that's what we do. That impacted, impacted me as well. And you can see from what Christine said that we need the strength of someone else doing it first. So you can see that that story that I tell has impacted Christine and Christine is then telling it to her students and impacting her students. So you can get the sense that your life story, when told you know, with a full heart, can have a huge impact on others because you're showing other people what it's like to be human. You're sharing what it's like to be human. And that's one of the reasons why, so, so every quarter now in the academy, so this is the quarter of creative resonance. And next um, is, I can't remember, I'll have to look at it. There's four different quarters, but creative resonance, we use the class, the strings of passion, but we also use two blueprints. One is the blueprint of the vision music, which you just learned. You just learned that over the last five days. And the other is the blueprint. It's a creative blueprint, a structure about how to tell your story with music. So we, we use both of those, but you can also go through the class with a piece, just a piece that you, that it's great to go through the class with a, a piece that you're sick of, that you can play in your sleep. People always ask you to play it and you're sick of it because you will learn how to love it. You will learn how to open it up. And Deborah is saying, ha ha. Oh, no, no, she's saying Hip Harp Academy is the place to share who you are in whatever form, in whatever space, in whatever level of development. Yes, you will be, you will be embraced as you are. And that's a step towards being able to embrace yourself. And 
nobody can do this easily. Nobody can, we, we are not taught to embrace ourselves. We need help to be able to do that so that we can go out into the world and then share the beauty of what we are and actually start to be able to discern the difference between what are things we, what are we um, like, what are all the little things, like what are all the things that we're trying to put on to, to prove that we're okay, that we're good enough, and they're actually getting in the way, and what's the true heart of the music? And, and often, I'm just, I'll just tell you a, a little story, and it's, it's a beautiful story. Um, I like it, it's a beautiful story. Um, uh, Shelley Fairplay, who many of you may know and many have worked with, and she's a wonderful, wonderful player. She had come to me, she was making a new show, and she wanted to make this show, um, one of the pieces in the show, she wanted to express her experience as a child in hearing Beethoven's, um, so, some, some Beethoven piece, where there's this all this Sturm und Drang, and then, and, and then out of it comes this beautiful little shepherd's song. And she said, I'll never have the time to learn, I'll never have to learn the turn, the, sorry, I'll never have time to learn Beethoven. What do I do? Do I play a record? Do I hire an orchestra? How do I do this? And I said, well, what is it that you want to, it sounds like what you want the audience to experience is this beautiful, simple melody coming out of all this darkness and, and you know, storm. And she said, yeah, right. And I said, kind of like what I said to you earlier, so Beethoven did it this way. How are you going to do it? How can we do it simply with the tools you already have? And so within three minutes, we were able to have her create something where she talked to the audience and said, I wanted to play all of Beethoven, but I couldn't. And I just wanted to create this storm and then this experience. So here goes. So she was able to tell them what she wanted to do so that they had an open mind, they weren't judging, is that Beethoven is not Beethoven, she was able to do something that was incredibly simple, technologically, and then have them have that experience, and have humor and humanness in it. So it was thousands of times more meaningful, humorous, lovable, adorable, powerful, than if she'd been able to actually play the Beethoven piece. But it took that deconstruction. That was, that was an example of looking at character and at deconstruction. You know, instead of doing what Beethoven did, what was Beethoven trying to create in his language? How do you create that with the tools that you have? And then how do you bring the character to it so that the audience has the same experience? So that's a perfect example of, of something that I can't remember what I was trying to show you. Um, but, but Deborah brought, brought it up. So um, the, I know that we're just about to run out of time and I am gonna stay here and answer questions, but I just want to say that the Academy is open. The enrollment is open and it will be closing. I can't remember the exact date. I think it's next Sunday night. So I think it's a week from now. It will be closing at Sunday night at midnight. I mean, it may be a day after that, I can't remember, but it will be closing down. And this is, if you're considering it, you should definitely come in now because then you get to go to the Monday masterclass, which we have two of them tomorrow. You'll get to go to the office hours. We're having two more webinars just for the members next weekend. That's all about um, uh, clarifying your vision and also how to power start your day. These are just things to get you started. So if if you're thinking, well, you can take everything I've given you and you can you can use it. It's yours. It's yours to create magic with. And if you but I, I just promise me that you will get the support and that you will get the community to support you in be in that journey. And if if I can be that support, if Hip Harp Academy can be the community that supports you, I would love that. I would love that because it is a magical place and it changes my life being part of it. If it's not, if this isn't the community for you, just promise me that you will get that support and you will get that community so that you will take this all the way. And 
if it's us, yay, I love that you will join us. And you just go to hipharpacademy.com. That's hip as in cool, harp as in the instrument, academy as in a world of learning and a world of sharing who you are. Okay, so I want to make sure that I tell you that before I start answering questions. I will stay here. I will answer all your questions, and I always love, love, love reading what you have to say. So Mark and, uh, and Deborah are saying, chores wait for no one. Got to go deal. All right, they've got to go deal with their cantankerous animals. Good. Well, you'll be able to come back and watch the rest of this. Beautiful. Um, Karen is saying, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have too. Um, but if you want to go now, oh, you know what? I'm just going to put the link right in the in here so that you can get right there. I'm happy to take you there. I'm happy to show you. I'll stay, you know, here and show you the logistics because sometimes people are like, yeah, but how does it work? And you know, but wait. I mean, I'm that person. I'm like, but wait, how do I get in? Like, where's the front door? And uh, what is, is it? You know, the, I need to know the logistical things. But I'll give you HTTPS. And somebody let me know if, if, you, if this is letting you in. And I'm going to go back up here um, to what you guys are saying. Ah, um, oh, these are beautiful. OK. OK, so um, Karen says, I see that I have actually touched on this liftoff. Yes, I have played meditation music in church on the harp and on the piano. It has nearly brought me to tears a few times. That is beautiful. That is what my teacher, Tony, used to say, you must become a, a victim of your own art. And, and what he meant was, yeah, it's got to it's gotta get to you. And it sounds like that was what Karen is saying. Um, it's brought me to tears a few times because it feels so beautiful and meaningful. I'm trying so hard <laughs> to enhance the meditation experience, and sometimes it will happen. And I'm sure when it happens, it will open up and it will be easy. Um, and Teresa's saying, just do it. And Elizabeth is saying, my biggest takeaway was during the roles discussion, when you said to take on the role of Diana for what you want to express in the music and put yourself aside. I realized that when I get my ego out of the way, I can just play. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that is the impact on you. The impact on others when you do that is absolutely magical because what you open up for yourself, you open up for everybody. And that's how beautiful the gift of creative resonance is and that freedom that, that Karen was talking about and also that Elizabeth is talking about, that freedom. <laughs> That freedom is not just a freedom that you have when you when you're able to touch uh, when you're able to touch that magic string, it opens for everyone. And this is making me think of a poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes, which is a few can touch the magic string and noisy fame is proud to win them. Alas, for those who never sing and die with all their music in them. That's what, what Elizabeth said made me think and why it's so important for me that we all do not die with our music in us. Because, not just because it's great to get that music out, but that music and that freedom and that willingness impacts others. It, the resonance, you know, you know what it's like when you're playing your harp and something else resonates in the room? And it drives you crazy and you have to figure out what that thing is and make it stop that buzzing it happens in a beautiful way as well when you're playing with freedom when you're really connecting it opens it opens resonance in others as well and then that comes back and opens you up and then there's even more creative resonance helisa is saying what it is like to be human connection not perfection yes oh, and what it is like to accept being human which I don't always do. Sherry says, I like the structure of the seven principles and look forward to going deeper. Good. Yeah, having that structure is great. And it doesn't always go in the same order. You go back and forth, just like we did when, when I said uh, that about the story about Shelley, that was taking deconstruction and character. And there may be other situations that you're in, like I'll be in a situation where I'm stuck and I'll be, okay, let me apply the seven strings of passion here. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to do this. I'm, uh, um, how, how, can I, how can I deconstruct it? 
What are the roles here? What is the character here? Um, wh what is the practice I, I need to put into play or to take out? What am I practicing that I don't want to practice? So you can use them in all different order. Andra says, the importance of courage and honoring our inner connection to the music and our own unique way of expressing it strikes me. Yeah, and I love, Andra, that you were, use the word courage, which has at the heart of it, kur, the, our heart, because rather than being like, I must, I must have courage, I must get it, hmm, it's like, you know, the Wizard of Oz, when the courage is always there, we can, we can go in to, to activate that courage, that connection, when we're truly connected and when we can have that feeling of freedom, then we will look like we have more courage, we will be acting with more courage, and, and it won't feel like it's more courage. It'll just feel like, oh, right, that's what I had to do. And um, Marianne is saying, doing what's essential to me, not what I'm good at. Oh, oh, beautiful. And those two are really interesting things to play with. Because you, yeah, doing what's essential, what's essential to me and not what I'm good at. Boy, that is another whole interesting thing. Um, playing with, with the joy of, of where we do have ease and yet also looking at what is essential to us and bringing ease into that. that this is something I'd like to think a lot more about. That, that's a really interesting thing I want to think more about. Catherine says, love the idea that the character is not just the dynamic marking but it is a feeling or a situation you imagine and trying to express. Yeah, Catherine, and as a composer from the other end, you realize that you, you want to write a story like, um, the, the hat just fell in love with the woman, and now it's afraid that the grandmother is going to come into the room, and that's why it starts soft and, 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 and slow. But you, you can't really write all of that, so you write, pianissimo and, you know, uh, you know, a tempo, poco a poco, and you begin to realize that all that character is a collaboration with the player. They are, um, they're, and, and the, the interesting thing is they don't have to be telling the same story as the composer. They just have to be telling a story that's meaningful to them, and then the story will resonate with others. It's beautiful. Cheryl is saying, you are so gracious and generous to share this with us. Well, I, can't, I love this. I would share it with everybody. The parts, the seven strings, are like a beautiful puzzle, waiting patiently for each of us to look at each piece as we see where we can experiment, try, and retry until it creates our own original musical picture. Yes. And another reason why it's the seven strings versus the seven pillars or the seven is because as you know from playing the harp, there are only seven strings in each octave. And yet, it is unlimited music. And as we shift, as, as we play in different modes, we unlock a different aspect of even just those same strings. If we never touch a lever, ever, we can still, and that's, I don't know if you noticed that that is part of the of the motifs of the vision music it, it goes from mode to mode and it never uses never changes the levers but it it shifts and it opens up new modes and this is why i call it the seven strings because they all work together they vibrate each other they can be done in any order any one of them can be the one that you are focusing on as your you know number one or your root or whatever and, and yet they're all resonating until eventually you are just there with your instrument, an expanded human with the prosthetic, the creative prosthetic of your instrument, an expanded human with expanded creative capabilities because of how connected you are and because this instrument has started to play who you are and it has started to also impact who you are. This is really a life journey for me because I could never figure out why I was playing the harp. I didn't like harp music. I didn't like carrying around a harp. I didn't get it. I didn't know why I was playing it until I started breaking down the strings of passion. And then I began to understand that this instrument allows me to be an expanded, 
express, have expanded expression. And it is so direct. My fingers on the strings, it impacts me as much as I impact it. And in this beautiful way, we are all so lucky to have made this choice. It's so, such a powerful choice to play this instrument. Joan is saying, I think I am learning that playing the harp is what I do now. I, I'm hearing the resonance of that story, like, this is what I do. This is a bit of a revelation in accepting my personal journey and choosing to be in the academy for a second year. Thank you, you're welcome. As you're talking, Joan, it's making me think of my running. I am like not a fast runner, but I run. I just run because it's such an important part of me. And sometimes I'll go through this thing like, I'll, I'll, I'll think, like as people are passing me right and left, because I live in Boston, so everybody's a runner. Um, and I'll be thinking, well, um, I, they don't know, I mean, I could have just come out of the hospital. They don't know why I'm running slowly. Like I'll go through all these like things, like what, who cares? Rather than, and now I'm really working hard, or I'm really working unhard to try to let go of all that and really be who I am as a runner and truly experience my running and what I love about it. Why do I want to go outside to run when it's 18 degrees out? There's something I love about that. That's what I do. Not because I'm good at it. I'm not good at it but it's what I do. And interestingly, I actually took a class recently in running and I did get more connected to it. So that's the other beauty of how, you know, rich the harp community is that we actually can, we don't have to, we, we can get that support as well. And that's part of what the Academy is about as well. Faith is saying, love everything, especially the emotional mystical part. How do I do all this while working on improving my technical prowess Yes, well, it, it does improve your technical prowess. Um, so part of what I observe is, um, and I just did a blog post about this, and I don't know if I actually put it up, but I observe that so many harpists stutter. Um, they're, they're not connected to the strings. And, and, and I know that there's voices going on, like that's the wrong, that's the wrong note, or you, do you get it? Did you have it? Is it right? Is it wrong? And so they're constantly stuttering. And constantly, again, as soon as they get something and away and saying them, I do this too, raising the bar so that that stuttering still is maintained, that disconnect. And so when you actually connect and really connect with what you're doing, it's, it gives you, it grounds your technique. Everybody's trying to expand their technique, but if you don't ground it, it's just going to fall over. So going back to this allows you to ground it. The other thing that, and I didn't talk about this today, but um, a part of liftoff is to just do it. So part of my, when I was learning how to play the harp, and I, I ended up in these situations where I had to learn like hard pieces like WC or something like that, where I hadn't been playing that long, and I would struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle. And at the end of every practice session, I gave myself the gift of playing the piece, playing the entire piece with complete character and none of the notes. And so I would look at the music and I would play whatever I played, you know, like um ba 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 So I was playing all the gestures of the music and none of the notes. And I played through the entire piece as if I had done it, and then like dum do do dum, you know. And that was why was I saying that? Oh, so th th there are those two sides of technique. One is to ground in your actual physical relationship to the instrument, and then the other is to allow yourself to play all the music and none of the notes. And I know that may sound completely crazy, but it gives you freedom. And then, and then you can, of course, also do all the standard practice techniques using, you know, your metronome and stuff like that, which is great stuff. But for me, these two poles of grounded, grounded technique. So when when you when people learn to meditate, 
and I know there are actual people who are like, that's what they do here. So tell me if I'm wrong. You're not trying to get the best meditation technique. Meditating is, is being there. It's a practice and you do it and you go to it every day. And so there's an element of that in music, of going to it, of sinking into it, of allowing it to be. And then there's the other side of it and how you're gonna connect those two. And eventually you will connect those two. You may never, I'm never gonna play. It's, it's, I mean, I see people play stuff on YouTube and I'm like, wow, I will never do that. But that does not mean that I will never have the experience of a, the pinnacle artistic experience or the pinnacle or be able to give others the pinnacle experience. I truly believe that you can create a pinnacle artistic experience for yourself and others at any level of technical ability when you can ground in it and you can be in it and that will then expand. And I struggled with this for years. I, it blew me away. So I was always like prowess. I am fast and I went da 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 da. And, and I refused to play a song like the, I refused to play the Nightingale actually. And um, when I finally was talked into, and I really had to be talked into playing the Nightingale because I just thought it doesn't show how good I am. Like anybody can play that. And, and when I finally accepted how moved the audience was, and I remember I had this moment when I was like, oh, are you kidding me? I had all the technique I needed after like a year of playing to move an audience if I would allow that. Why did I work so hard? Well, I did because I wanted to, and it was fun, and there were all kinds of things like that. But what I also did was shut down that impact. And I, was, I, wanted, to be, I wanted to be impressive. I wanted people to be impressed with me instead of realizing that this simple, beautiful thing was love. People felt love. So what I'm saying here faith is that your prowess will expand once you ground really ground in what you can do then you can add little bits but it also just expands once you ground in it and i think a lot of people don't feel that because they don't ground in it and vera is saying the academy is also about learning to express feelings on the harp which are not easy because of the nature of the instrument. So I, I'm, I just got to laugh because Vera is like, is so, has so much prowess and, and can do so, so much technically with the instrument. And it's hard for me to imagine that, that you're having trouble expressing any of the feelings because you do it so beautifully with the music, but each of us are, are want to expand that. And that's part of what we'll do, Vera. Expand it through all of you, through every part of you. Um, aha, Mary May says, I fear I'm not good enough. That qualifies you for the Academy, May. I think, I think everybody in the Academy fear, including me, fears they are not good enough. That just, you, you just qualified for the program there, right there. Um, Barbara said, I just, I just appreciate you, DHC. Great, and how passionate you are about what you are teaching. Barbara, I want to say that my passion about teaching has happened because of the Academy. You, you are what has, has opened up for me the, the passion for, for sharing this and how much I get what I get. I was not the musician that I am today when I started the Academy, but working with all of you, being able to see, being blown away by how powerful when someone breaks through and actually, you know, says, ah, screw it, I'm just going to do this. Um, it's just so powerful and so beautiful. And I, 
this is a deep, deep, important part of my life now. Um, so your enthusiasm and emotional expression as you share your how, why, et cetera, creates such a safe and elegant space for us to practice, learn, and share in. Thank you, Barbara. That You couldn't say anything more powerful to me. I needed that space. I needed that space in my life. Sometimes I got it, and that's why it's so important for me to create that in the academy. I'm just imagining just the, the amazing, just the beauty that comes out of it because it's safe. And so you're, you're blooming in it, it, within it. Halise says, I am a little confused about tomorrow. Are the master classes morning and evening different than the final five day challenge? Okay, so Halise, thanks for asking. So in the academy, I, 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 let me tell you how the week goes. In the academy every Monday, there are two master classes, one at 11 a.m. Eastern time, one at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. It's the same content, except for it's, I mean, except it's different because it's live. It's just too different because there are a lot of people in the academy in different time zones. So we split it and had it in two because it was just, just so that it, so that each one wasn't just packed, packed, packed with people, and so people would be able to actually, may, may, you know, not be overwhelmed with too many people there. Um, what we do on Mondays is. I teach you a little snippet that always happens, and that's thanks to um, Melinda, who started asking for that. I teach you a snippet, and then I start talking to you um, and answering questions. And then usually, once um, after the first week, I mean, this is warm-up week, so we're just going to answer questions and just be there, and I'll talk about the strings of passion and what we're doing. But then, as soon as the class starts, people are sharing their work, and then we look at four or five people's work each week and we're not look, we're not critiquing it we are um they're asking questions and then i'm helping them to get to where they want with the work but it it opens it up for everybody so some people are sharing every week they're sharing a video every week kind of like the videos that some people put in the challenge but then we're watching that video and we're saying okay what um what what where can we find liberation inspiration or empowerment where where is this share giving that to us what are we seeing here so we we learn to look at other people's work and also ourselves as in what is it opening up for us because every time someone shares it opens up for you something i could never i i don't have enough brain power you know to come up with all the things that you guys bring in you bring the richness in so we look at that video for what it's giving us what it's giving us and then usually people have a question like i'm struggling with this part of it what what's another option i could do and then i can answer those questions so i'm a coach i'm not a teacher i mean i'm taking you through this but i'm coaching you to where you want to go and so when you share videos, I'm not going to critique the video. I'm going to want to know, what do you want me to look at? What do you not want me to look at? And what do you want help with? So looking at those videos is a huge part later on of, uh, of what we do. And it's people from the academy, maybe you can talk about that. It, it, it's one of the most powerful things that, that you can see because you're, 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 you're seeing how other people are engaging with the material you're learning to stop comparing and despairing you're learning to stop critiquing you're learning to look for what it opens up for you and then that allows you to see that all over the world and then eventually it, it helps you to not be so critical with yourself and at least that's what we're going to do. So does that give you an idea? You can cut, you don't have to do anything to come. You can just, you can just arrive, just arrive with your harp and, and that will be, and, and be like, tell me everything or, or you can come with a question. Um, Elizabeth said, if I post my journey using these motifs on YouTube, what would you like me to put for credit? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, you could put a credit Hip Harp Academy and you could put, um, um, motifs, um, uh, um, like, you know, my interpretation of the Vision Music Suite by Deborah Hansen Conant. So 
that's probably the the easiest i would just call it the vision music suite and um your interpretation does that work for you that's a great question felicity says you don't need to be good enough mary just jump in um my brain is going into like five different directions i love that statement Halee said may i freeze may i freeze in trying to remember <laughs> May I freeze in trying to remember with mentally or by fingers the motifs early? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, so this is really great. One of the great things about the motifs is you don't have to get them right. Because if you get them wrong, it's just a different motif. So Helice, you and, and 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 some people I know I remember last year one person was like, I don't like how this sounds. So instead I took the the I took it down a third. I took that down a third and went and it went like this. So you know, not liking it is a is an excellent creative impulse, a creative um it'll it'll help you get to a new place make it a mistake even better forgetting and having to come up with something even better they're all they're all great you can forget everything and the intention of playing the motif is enough and then you might end up doing something different every day that's great beautiful i'm glad you brought that in nancy said it's may hi may and not nan okay you are more than ready for this trial. Okay, beautiful. I love how you guys are saying all these. Lori says, we all have different gifts. Yes, that are identified in community and are given to each of us to build up the community into like Martin Luther King's beloved community. Exactly. And that was something I never, 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 ever expected. I mean, when I first made um, the classes, I just wanted to teach the skills and the tools of improvisation, which is what I do teach. I do teach the skills and the tools of improvisation. But something happened. And I mean, I remember, I remember when I was there at a, a chat and I was like, oh my God, I was told that as a, as a leader, com, you know, community will happen if you build, build something. And I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen to me. And then I just remember one day being like, Oh, that's it. This is this is now a community of itself. This is now has its own identity. It's it's this beautiful thing, and um, it's it's beautiful, so beautiful to be part of it. Um, great. And so this has been a nice week on my heart. Beautiful. Nancy says playing music in church for the walls. I love that. Has brought me also to tears. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for all your thank you. The link you posted does work. Yay, great. Wendy uh, is saying, can we join the Academy and just begin with the first quarter? Yes, I'm a bit nervous about being able to take. Oh, so here's the whole thing. Um, you join the Academy, you don't have, if if you just joined the quarter, it would be, it's, it's like almost $1,000 for the quarter. And so it's just smarter to just join the whole Academy. And um, because then that gives you the whole year. You don't have to do everything. What some people will do is they will take one quarter and focus, and then they'll take a quarter off. And maybe they'll take one little class or just some people just come to the chats, the master classes, and sometimes they come to the office hours when they want to. And that is it. That's what they do. That's how they use the academy. Some people don't come to the chats at all and they just go to the individual classes to learn specific things like harmony or how to sing with your harp. Some people, so some people never show up at the chats. That's just, that's just not how they engage with the academy. So different people use it in different ways. And then some people, like I said, will do one quarter. And then some, like for example, blues. We, we have a quarter where we're looking at blues, we're looking at other things too. Some people don't like blues. Or they're not they're not connected to it, so they can either choose something else to do during that quarter and you know what i'm going to do i'm going to take you in and show it to you in a second, I just want to answer. Some more of these questions and then I'll, I'll literally take you in and take a look at it, but let me know. Um, it's totally worth every penny by, and and the amazing instruction, but I want to be able well here's the other thing, um, this is a really important thing. 
and it's something I learned in the academy. I pay for something and I want to get as much out of it as I possibly can. Like I want to do everything. I want to make sure I'm there every day and get everything. And that doesn't, it doesn't, it, you don't need to. You only need to get one thing, one little thing, and it will change, it will change your life. Having it there and having the community there makes a big difference, knowing that the support is there, knowing you, knowing that you have it. And that's just the way that I created it, is that it's it's a year, it's a year commitment where that commitment doesn't mean I'm gonna be doing everything every day. It means I that's a committed place. I can go there. And then many people sign on for the next year and the next year and the next year because they just find it to be a place of support, a place that they can go. Um, but it's absolutely fine. And some people, um, we actually don't have the link up there to do just this quarter. I'm going to try to see if we can do that. That's a possibility, but it's just not that much less. And so, um, but, but, but I can try to put it up. I think I can get that up by tomorrow, just so you can see it, so that you can have that choice. Um, and Halise says, uh, of resonance in a room, let's see. I just want to really go to what, what Wendy says here. Um, I want to be responsible to myself and to you. Um, so first of all, you do not have any responsibility to me. I mean, we have accountability. I mean, we're there, I'm there, and I'm, I love it when you're there but you don't have any responsibility to do everything. And a lot of people, that scares them the first qu quarter. They're like, I have to do it and I have to get everything. And then they begin to realize that it doesn't matter. Even if you just do every other week, or even if you come in at the last you know, week of a quarter, that you miss, it doesn't matter, you still get. I mean, people who are in the academy, I'll, Am I am I right about that? I mean, I think that's how it is because that's how people seem to to respond. That you don't have to get everything. And um, are you feeling like I'm answering your question, Wendy, or do you feel like I'm just kind of like you know, twisting it around? No, I, I feel like you are. Um, I I can definitely see myself doing it over this period of time, but because of other responsibilities in life. Yep. I just won. I was just wondering. Well, I think that yeah, I think there's. I think I think that's a great question, and I th and I know. I mean, I know now that I've had the academy. When I join other other communities, I know that I'm going to jump in. I'm going to be really gung ho in the beginning. Then I'm I'm going to kind of like find a time when I'm just not really. There's there's always a time when I'm just not kind of there, and then I will come back in. So that's another reason that I set it up this way. That it's okay. It's okay if you are really involved in, in the first quarter, and then after that, you're just adding little things, or you're just coming in for this or that. And I tried to make the the price so that it's it doesn't if it's fine. You don't have to feel bad about doing that. Does that help, Wendy? Or and feel. Yeah. Yeah, feel yeah, free to go with me as well. Yeah, I, I get, I get it. Okay, well, feel free to email me if you have other questions or concerns or whatever. And if you don't see that that I that we've put up the possibility of a single quarter, just just remind me, and then we'll I do. Actually, it. already wrote wrote to you. So yes, I remember that. It. Yeah, but it, it's always a good idea to send a reminder. Because I sometimes get a little overwhelmed, especially if it's a complicated question. So I always love hearing more than once. But yeah, thank you for doing that. Okay, great. And thank you. For can I just quickly say something? It's Vimukti here. I just want to yes. quickly just share. Um, I was in the academy for a year and I hardly did anything with it. I hardly put any effort into it at all. And it was coming up to renew my uh, membership or not. And I decided I wouldn't. Um, so I just um, downloaded some stuff that I could. Um, from the academy and I wrote to Deborah and thanked her for what I had got out of it and the moment I sent that email to Deborah it felt wrong so I went online and I joined up again and within a week within a week I started having aha moments and ever since I've been really challenging myself with it even though I don't have much time to do it and the money because one of the things was well this is a lot of money for me I'm not working at the moment I've got no income whatsoever um, and 
I tell you what, it's invaluable. I cannot say anything other than that, that what I've got from this, and I will stay with this as long as Deborah does it now, because it is just opening me up so much. And so thank you. I just wanted to share that. Well, thank you for saying that. And I loved it and when, when Vimukti wrote to me and wrote that. It was great. And I was like, yes, I, I totally get it. And then it was so powerful, you know, when, when, when the switch happened and when, and when you, and then suddenly there was this commitment. And I love that you actually allowed yourself to say, I'm, I'm done to let that open up. It's almost like it was, I'm, it, it almost like it opened, it was a completion that then opened up a new door. It almost felt like that. And, and, it was, and it was really powerful, I remember that, yeah. And it's helped me in the classes that I'm in to, to understand that I don't have to be, I'll, I'll get something out of it. I'll get what I need, um, maybe not exactly in the way that I think I'm going to, but it's helped me to see that. As I'm teaching it, I, I see people getting that, it's helped me. But this is not to convince you, Wendy, and just, just feel free to ask. And what I'll try to do is, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to think, there's usually times when, um, I mean, I have a lot, I want to go through all these, but then I love it when I can leave you guys together so you can talk to other people in the academy without me there, because it just lets you be a little freer. Um, if I can do that, I'll do that um, at the end of this time. I just want to read through all these and, and keep asking, Wendy, I, I, I love that you, that you're standing for yourself. I mean, that's really, that's beautiful. I, I love that. Um, can we do, okay, great. Uh, Halisa saying, of resonance in a room, my cat used to sit on my lap between my harp and me while I practiced, and he would purr in heaven, in heaven with the vibe from the harp. Um, oh, now, now we're on to cats. Okay, that's great. Okay, I love it. Um, I will be traveling for a month in a few weeks. Can I pick up where I left off this in this training? Oh, May wants to know, this training will be closed in a week. So download whatever you can. If you're an academy member, it opens up in the academy for you, but it'll be closed down as a free training, as, or even as a paid training. It'll just be closed down. These are beautiful. Meditation is, an, is the effort to do. I want to know more about that, Vimukti. Um, and that I is, know that we will. That is, that, that, Deborah, that is just meditation is sitting with whatever your practice is and just making that effort to sit or to stand or whatever you do to do it. It, it, it that that is meditation whether it be for one minute five minutes 10 minutes 20 minutes it's just, it's just it's the practice it's just what you talk about about practice that is meditation beautiful beautiful and that kind of brings me to one other thing that's that's shifting in the academy some of the members of the academy are starting to to bring in different groups like we now have a harp therapy discussion group um we have a book group a book reading group and we're trying to open up to make it easier for uh the community co to connect with each other but there's always a technical I, we're trying to i just bought this new um thing called circle but now i have to figure out how to use it technically so Anyway, but I love that now these little, you know, and, and a Qigong group, you know, all these little things are starting to, to um, emerge as well. Uh, Val says, always so good to hear you say all these deep, powerful messages. You'll always be my mentor. Ah, oh, Valerie. Yay. That's great. So great to see you. Nancy said, I still can't play the nightingale without crying after more than a decade. Beautiful. Um, um, and, and Nancy's uh, not good enough, but learning and learning so much from the method. Okay, beautiful. Helen said, Deborah, there was one workshop where you blew me away, brought me to tears with Twinkle Twinkle's Little Star. You don't have to leave, yes, you do not have to leave a tune behind. Yes, that's really deeply important to me. I love the music. I will never get over, you know, I've been working on the railroad, even though I know that it, you know, there's all kinds of historical things that may not be so great about it. I love these songs and I don't want to leave them behind. And, and there's so much that we can do with them. We can open them up. Hands on harmony is, is um, and also sing and play harp are, are little classes in the academy that show you how to do that, how to reharmonize them so that they're, they're rich. And that you, so you don't have to leave them behind. So you become richer and richer and richer with music through your life. 
And I, I totally understand if people have to leave, don't worry. And you can always email me if you have questions. Alex says, I love hearing this about simplicity. I play easily when it's by ear and a tune that I love. That's just beautiful. I play easily when it's by ear and a tune I love. Oh, but I feel like I'm cheating. That, the feeling that you're cheating, Alex, that is, the, that is such a great, uh, that, that tells you you're doing the right thing. The minute you feel like cheating in music, you are doing something you really want to keep doing. And I think that's true of any creative endeavor and probably some technical endeavors as well. We put ourselves through these hoops that are just absurd. And when we allow ourselves to cheat, cheat, <laughs> pretend, is when we open up to who we actually are. I, to I so get that. And it's, I, I remember like the first time I felt that as a kid. And I was like, no, I can't do it that way because that's cheating. It's too easy. You know, like that was my gift. But I, I denied myself and the world that gift. So I am right now telling you, cheat, cheat, cheat. They paid me to come here and be a harpist. And I'm just playing easy stuff. And I'm a fraud, even though I see what the audience responds to, the easy stuff, right? So I don't know about you, Alex, but I think sometimes I, I, can, I can literally use that concept of roles or archetypes and just be like, I am the fraudster, or like I am, I am the goddess of, of all frauds, you know, whatever, just to um, allow. Because otherwise, what happens is we start shutting off those things that are easy for us, or at least I do, and then I don't even have access to them. And those are the things that move people. I don't know if you've ever seen <laughs> there's um, the husband of of um, Pum Pumehana, who's a harpist who's been in the academy for a long time. Her husband, of course, doesn't play the harp, but he's like a rock and roll guy. And every time he comes to the harp, he's like, he just like does all this stuff and he's like pretending. And it's so great. And it's all this stuff that, you know, all of us, that it would be so great for us to embody. And yet he's just pretending. And so anyway, Alex, that kind of goes along with that. And I, I love that you shared that. I feel like we should have like fraud week. Yes, yes, fraud week. Um, okay, great, great, great. Wonderful piece and people are leaving. I love that you were here. I love that there's still so many people here. And Joan says, see you all tomorrow. Okay, gotta go. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, gorgeous, don't try to learn everything. Yeah, great. I'm just trying to come um, here. Lynn says, you can't possibly get everything. Yeah, certainly not in one hearing. Well, that's why we spiral around in the academy. You, and that's why we go from one to the other. I'm going to, there's 35, no, there's not 35 new messages. I'm going to get through these and then I'm going to just open it up just so you can see the academy and totally understand if people need to leave. Um, Lori says, thanks to everyone. Another inspirational event. Yay. Um, I am inspired by this. I'm, I'm inspired. I love this, this quarter. I love teaching creative resonance. And uh, Nancy says, difference between a harp teacher and the hip harp community, with a teacher you are responsible or accountable to your teacher for the lesson. Hmm. With DHC, you are accountable to yourself. Yes, Nancy, that is, that is exactly right. You're accountable to yourself, whatever that means, without beating yourself up. I mean, we all do, but, but I don't want you to. Marguerite says, do you still offer the monthly? Yes, yes, sorry. Yes, there are monthly payments. You can sign up and there's a payment plan. It's not, it's not, you're not in the, you're, you're still committing for a year, but there are month, but you can pay monthly and that's available. Also, there's a, we finally got PayPal as well as credit cards. And I think PayPal has their own uh, other options that I don't know about. Nancy, may I qualify that about the teacher, which is that when you are taking up the time of a teacher and paying your teacher, what can happen is if you're unprepared, you don't get another lesson. I see. Okay. I mean. <laughs> All right. I get it. Well, that, yeah, that's right. Well, one of the beautiful things about community, the community of, of the academy is that it, you know, is that there are so many people there. Yeah, and it's always inspiring to me. So no, you will not get kicked out at any point. Um, Halise, uh, have to go for other commitments. Great, great session, beautiful. Can I just say, 
that I can't join the academy, but I buy separate courses. Yes. Yes, Helen, that's fine too. <laughs> Actually, what I'm saying is I'm so happy I found you. Yes, you can buy the separate classes. And, and Wendy, we just haven't set up this quarter to make that possible. And I, I, and, and I promised myself I would do it, but I just didn't do it yet. Kathleen said, you have such a spirit, and I thank you for sharing it. Yay, good. Um, oh, yay. Okay, so Anne says she's here, and she is happy to host an after chat. So anyone who wants to stay, talk to students after I leave, just stay another 10 minutes, and then I'll, I will leave and leave you in Anne's hands. Um, Nancy says, Fraud Week, please. Can Fraud Week be open to everyone? Yes. We occasionally have, uh, what do we have? Uh, I know Sally did it, um, Bad Music Week, where everybody is required to play something really badly and share it. Deirdre says, thank you, Devorah. Wonderful having the opportunity to strengthen the experience of music. Beautiful. All right, let me take you quickly in just so you can see it, and then I will leave you in Anne's capable hands. Anne is one of the Academy's student liaisons, and she offered to host salons after our chat so that people can get to know each other. Let me just quickly take you in just so you can see the inside because that's something you don't get to see when you're looking on the outside okay so what's this close that down um so i'm just going to go in here to the dashboard and there's two ways so somebody talked about individual classes this is what these are the individual classes there's an academy learning vault and you can sign up for many of these individual classes they each have a, a, a page i can show them to you but they're they're not i mean i'm not going to show you now anyway there, there's you can see them on i'll show you where to find them so you can sign up for these individually but this is how we're doing it now so we've got the creative resonance quarter we've got the grounded expansion quarter where we're taking a different kind of improv that has a safe um, like a safe place and then an adventure place and then a safe place and then an adventure place. So creative resonance focuses on the strings of passion and vision music or telling your story with music. That's one form of improvisation. Grounded expansion is another form of improvisation in which you play something that's very safe that you may know. It may be a classical piece followed by an improv section back to the safe place back to the improv section. And this was one of the ways that I first started learning to improv. It, it's a really beautiful bridge from classical music to improvisation. And it's how I built Baroque flamenco. Because it wasn't what it, it I didn't set out to build it. It, it, it developed over time. The, this quarter, the summer quarter is called the power of pattern. And this is the kind, this is a different kind of improv where you have a constant simple um, repeated form like the blues like the blues is a is a pattern a 12 bar pattern but there are even smaller patterns called vamps and that makes it very easy to improvise well the vamps make it very easy to improvise the blues is a little bit more complex because it's 12 bars the vamps are often two bars or four bars long and the power here is the power of an underlying pattern that you learn to embellish. You start with a simple pattern, you embellish it, embellish it, embellish it, embellish it. That's this kind of improv. And blues happens to be built on that. That's one thing that comes out. The final quarter is structure is freedom. And that is where you create a scaffolding for the improvisation. And the scaffolding is a five day, sorry, five day, is a five part form. So this one, the form always stays the same and repeats over and over and gets more embellished. In this form, you apply a structure to a simple melody, and that's how you build it out. So these are basically the four different ways that I learned to improvise. Motivic improv, back and forth between a safe place and an adventurous place. A a fundamental pattern that gets embellished to a powerful degree in, in the blues, for example, and then the applying of a, of a compositional form. So what's, what's really powerful about this is that this, this is like what Mozart and Beethoven, this is the structure they use, but we play, use a very simple version of it. So that's what the academy, that's what we're doing each quarter. 
And like I said, some people are like, I don't want to play the blues, but it's because they don't know how amazing it can be. But and at that quarter, they may be like, no, I'm going to do, um, you know, I'm going to do one of these other things. I'm going to work on the blueprints for creativity, or I'm going to work on vamps and loops or something like that. And so they can come down and do that instead. So I hope that was helpful to just give you a kind of a a sense of what that's like. Are there any final practical questions? And if not, I'm going to turn you over to Anne. Uh, oh, okay. So Faith is saying, if you want to look at the economic value, hmm, consider this. My auto insurance costs almost $2,000 a year, and I pay it because it's legally required. <laughs> Joining the academy is much less than that, but I need it emotionally, spiritually, practically. Faith, I'm putting that on the website. I'm putting it on. And and it, and I just want to tell you, if, I love the things that you guys say. And if you're not OK with me sharing anything, let me know. Otherwise, you may end up seeing something from this um, out in the world. And you can always say, like, no, take that down. Um, it's fine. And Wendy says, thank you so much. What an inspiration. I love the energy. Thank you. You are so welcome. Nancy says, I cannot gin either. OK, must be more frugal. But you are learning so much. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and then we open it up you know, every quarter for challenges and stuff. OK, there are still over 20 people here. So I'm going to turn this over to Anne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I hope I see every one of you in the Academy. And of course, those who are already in, I can't wait to see you tomorrow and can't wait to go through um, Creative Resonance with you. And everybody else, just let me know if you have questions. I really hope that I see you. Enjoy the rest of the challenge. You have until tonight at midnight to get all the answers in for the grand prize, and then we're going to hold that tomorrow. And uh, OK, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to pull everybody up for a second here and then turn it over to Anne. Hello. Oh, we still have people. Oh, we have many people who are off, off video. Excellent. Oh, I see. Now they're coming on. Beautiful. Anne, this is Anne, one of our uh, one of our student liaisons and i'm going to turn it over to you i'm going to make you the host and put you in charge thanks everybody and i look forward to seeing you soon i love that you guys are here okay bye see you soon i've made you the host i'm going to stop the recording